How are you today? Pretty good. Um, it's my first uh, meeting in the morning. Uh, really glad to have you here and also talk to you through the internet. Oh, wow. Okay. I hope it's not too tiring for you too early in the morning. Uh, not, not at all. I mean, uh, it's 10 a.m., so not, not too bad. So um, Taiwan has been the most democratic country in the world, I mean, in East Asia, and <laughs> ranked at 11 in the world, according to The Economist, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the annual Democracy Index 2020. And it was quite impressive how other civil liberties have been backsliding globally due to the pandemic, but Taiwan has managed to make a big advancement. So we're curious to know how Taiwan has managed and how you, as the district minister, has managed to bring such a big investment in the country. Yeah, uh, the key is to trust the citizens. Instead of innovating for the people, uh, we're innovating with the people. So, for example, uh, in Taiwan, when we ration out the mask, when we did the contact tracing, uh, when we distribute the vaccines and so on, all those uh, different technologies uh, were co-invented. Uh, many uh, civic technologists uh, in the social sector came up with very good idea, like visualizing the mask supplies, uh, like using a SMS instead of an app for contact tracing and so on. Uh, so we call this reverse procurement, where the specification, the idea, Idea, the norms are created by the people and the state just implements it. Right. Uh, in fact, Korea benchmarked uh, to some of the, the strategies that Taiwan took during the, the COVID and how you have uh, managed to bring about the, the application to a real time stop of the mask and, uh, and other um, issues. Uh, is there any other um, strategy that Taiwan benchmarks South Korea in, in vice versa? Well, I think we certainly learned uh, both ways, right? Uh, I've talked to the teenage civic technologist uh, in Seoul, I believe, uh, who implemented the mask rationing alongside the, the Taiwan team. So that was really good. Uh, and uh, I also uh, learned that uh, Korea very early on had this idea of a vaccine availability map uh, where people can register for the kind of leftover residual uh, vaccines, uh, as well as offering real-time book updated information uh, for everyone, or well, at least in the metropolitan areas. Uh, and that's also something that we learned later on around July last year. Right. Uh, in fact, uh, I mean, due to the Omicron, the variant, it has been uh, making a big difference. And uh, a lot of local media outlets have been comparing how South Korea and Taiwan have been handling. But in fact, it has diverged in a different direction that we now have a lot of the confirmed cases while Taiwan is still managing quite well, relatively. So what do you think, what's the difference between South Korea and Taiwan? Well, um, so I, I wouldn't speak so soon, right? It, it, it's true that we're still at, uh, yesterday was 15 uh, local confirmed Omicron cases, but Omicron has a way to grow exponentially. So while we can say so far, uh, it's probably thanks to the very quick contact tracing that led us uh, follow very closely the speed of the virus. Um, it may or may not continue to hold this way. So I wouldn't say that we have diverged uh, and I wouldn't say we're post-pandemic, we've postponed the pandemic a little bit. Right. Um, it's interesting to see how uh, you bring the reverse procurement, how you invite the civic participation. And uh, I noticed that there's uh, several different platforms like Gov Zero showing different uh, mm -hmm. uh, information from the government. And also, you also have the platform called Join. Mm -hmm. uh, if you don't mind, could you briefly introduce what this platform is and how you invite the social discussion and participation? Certainly. So um, JOIN is a public infrastructure maintained by the government that is a one-stop shop for e-petition, for participatory budgeting, for the uh, regulatory pre-announcements and many other participatory forums. Uh, because it's managed uh, by the government, uh, it enjoys very high accessibility. I think more than 30 million visits, uh, which in Taiwan with 23 million is a lot. Uh, and so people generally trust that if they reach 5,000 signature, for example, uh, for the petitions, then a minister uh, will come out and respond uh, point by point. If it's interagency, twice a month, uh, my office hosts interagency 
meetings that also meets with the members of the public uh, that to co-create solutions uh, to the issues raised by the petitioner and so on. So it's uh, public infrastructure. Now Gov0 or G0V is civic infrastructure maintained by the social sector. So just like join the GOV, the TW is a website maintained by the government. Join the G0V, the TW is uh, maintained by the social sector. So just ch changing O to a zero uh, in the digital services and you get into kind of a shadow government uh, that's maintained uh, with open source uh, free software principles and they fork, that is to say, make alternate versions of government digital service. We talk about mask visualization, uh, contact tracing, and so on, and offer it for free so that the state uh, can also amplify that through reverse procurement. So Gov0 is a little bit more like research, uh, and JOIN is a little bit more like development. Right. Um, so you mentioned about the, like, how you, um, people can collect the petition, the signatures, for, in order to make the policy into real life. And actually, in fact, in South Korea, we do have some similar um, platform where people can write their uh, petition regarding certain social issues, but they need to collect more than 200,000 signatures within uh, 30 days. Wow. So uh, we have not managed to bring about more sustainable plan or make it into a real policy that will actually satisfy a lot of people. So what makes this different? What are the key factors that's really vital in order to make these um, policies or proposals from the public to be implemented in real life? Um, so just to ask a clarifying question, uh, if someone raises a successful petition in 30 days, do they get uh, to meet uh, with the officers from the agencies or the minister? Uh, so the government has to respond. Uh -huh. to but not face to face. Yeah, not face to face. Sometimes it could be um, one petition, for example, was about the, the vaccine uh, mandatory mm -hmm. uh, pass. Oh, that we had that too. Yeah. We had that too. <laughs> I think it's an issue that's happening in Taiwan as well. Uh -huh. uh, so the, it was the, the head of the CDC, the mm -hmm. Korean CDC, uh, answered the question. So we get the response, but we don't really get like a real policy implemented in, I see. in a sustained way. I see. Uh, I think uh, an innovation that we took very early on, since 2016, uh, is a team of participation officers, that is to say people charged with engaging the public in each ministry. And so in 2017, for example, when there was a petition about uh, the quote unquote, um, hostile experience of tax filing, end of quote. Um, it's facilitated by the POs, the participation officers uh, of different ministries. That is to say, the breakout groups were facilitated, for example, for tax issues, maybe facilitated by the coastal guard. But when we talk about the ocean affairs, opening up the ocean, uh, maybe it's facilitated by the finance or tax agency participation officers in the breakout group. And the reason why is that uh, the Coastal Guard also files income tax themselves. And the tax agency person maybe also uh, surfs, right, or also uh, fishes amateur. So the idea is that those POs take on the side of citizens listen to the citizens and advocating for them with their public service, public administration training. And so bridges, mediators, uh, such as the POs, I believe is very important because if it's an interagency issue, there's probably room for innovation with the public, but we really need to work on a either face-to-face -face or very closely designed online uh, participation forum in order to figure out where the innovation should be. Very interesting how people take different roles and try to understand. And I, mm -hmm. I guess the key here is the listening to the other uh, person's uh, position, I guess. Mm, also um, working across sure. silos, I think. That's 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 the point, yeah. Because the, the coastal guard is not in charge of tax uh, policy. So when they facilitate a conversation about tax, they take the citizen side. I think that is the main right. difference. Right. Um, when you became the this the youngest at, at the age of 35, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, how challenging was it while, while you're working with the other members of the cabinet who must be much older than you? 
Not at all, uh, because I was a reverse mentor uh, to the previous cabinet uh, since 2014, when I was 33 years old. Uh, I worked for a couple years uh, with then Minister Jacqueline Tsai uh, in her office. And uh, actually, it's the same physical office as my office now. So in many senses, I'm just promoted to full time from an intern, so to speak. Uh, and uh, I don't think age uh, is the difference here. I think the main difference uh, is the uh, uh, experience on teleworking, the experience on uh, crowdfunding and crowdsourcing and so on. And I'm very happy to report that regardless of age, many people in Taiwan's cabinet did have a entrepreneurship uh, background or a science and technology background that allowed them to engage the public in a very open manner. Wow. So I guess you also have now your own that's right. Too. Young people, people who guides me. Yes, I'm old now. I'm 40 now. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so how does it really work when mm -hmm. you have certain issues? Do they like uh, they like do they have certain input? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. How does it? How does the mentorship? Work? Sure. Yeah, uh, so formally, since 2016, they are advisors uh, to the cabinet uh, in the Youth Advisor Council. Uh, so uh, the 35, I think, uh, councillors, um, almost all of them younger than 35, uh, form kind of the backbone of the reverse mentoring system. Of course, there's also younger mentors uh, in the ministries level, in the agency levels, in the local governments level, and so on. So our youth advise us. Uh, they can, for example, um, host a meeting in any locality, uh, and through me, they get to call the responsible uh, authorities uh, to the same table to listen to the young people. But again, this is not just to provide answers, but to co-create over a course of an entire afternoon or so uh, on the issues that needs uh, innovations. So all this is to amplify their ideas into national level in like just 24 hours uh, or a couple weeks and so on. So if we see a new way of working together uh, on a smaller locality, we can adopt it on a national scale in a very quick fashion. So mostly it's just uh, commissioning meetings, a meeting with the premier uh, on our um, biannual, uh, sorry, half a year, every half a year meetings, and also meeting the ministers as well as the agencies uh, to provide new directions, uh, usually right before the budget allocation cycle, uh, so that it could be written into the New Year's directions. Uh, I was just going through the history and then I saw that you were actually involved in the 2014 Sunflower Movement. Mm -hmm. And I guess this has been the turning point for Taiwan's democracy and it, there are more youth participation. And even the economists highlighted that there's more uh, younger generations who are participating in social issues and politics. So since you've become the, the digital minister, uh, has there been more number of young uh, politicians and also more uh, youth participation? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, we've seen many people who are interested uh, in civics and politics from a very early age. And indeed, uh, at this very moment, uh, constitutionally, uh, we're talking about uh, changing uh, the voting age, right, uh, to 18 years old. Previously, it was 20 in our constitution. But uh, even as we're having this discussion, many people younger than 18 are already, I wouldn't say dominate, but providing a significant fraction of the joint platform petitions. Some of the most popular petitions were uh, by people who just turned 17, for example, the one about banning plastic straws in bubble tea takeouts uh, with this uh, sea turtle choke by uh, straws. Uh, the picture which went viral is a meme. Uh, it gathered 5,000 signatures in a very short time. And when I ask uh, Wang Xuanru, the petitioner, why should uh, she uh, provide such a uh, very interesting petition uh, in her school time? Time. And she said, it's our civics class assignment, right? The teacher just assigned raising a petition as a civics class assignment. And I think it's really great that uh, Commissioner Wang now uh, is uh, part of our National Action Plan Steering Committee, 
for open government, even though she's um, just 19 uh, at the moment. Uh, so I think in Korea, as well as in Taiwan, we have this seniority culture, uh, but we can flip this around if a person that is not yet 20 years old, nevertheless, holds uh, the cabinet advisor or a, a steering committee commissioner title, then we also yield to that title and they can participate in much more peer-to-peer -peer fashion. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, actually, because uh, I also read the interview that you've done recently with Nikkei. And we, as South Koreans, as you said, we value the seniority and legacy of the Confucianism. We have to respect the elder and we always have to listen to them. But, but because of that, there's clash between the generations. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to um, converge or mm -hmm. reach a consensus mm -hmm. between the different generations. And now uh, we will be heading into presidential election in a month's time. And the casting voters are, in fact, the, the, those young generation in 20s and 30s. And there has been a lot of focus on those young generations, how we can reach out to them and how we can promote more youth participation and how they can be more involved in a political and social issues. Mm -hmm. So what kind of advice would you give to South Korea? Well, learn from the citizens uh, and uh, basically the idea of reverse mentorship means that the younger people uh, as mentors uh, are your teachers. Uh, a key pillar of Confucianism uh, is to respect right, the heaven, the earth, the royalty, the parents and the teachers. Uh, so the younger people are our teachers and they can too uh, be one of the peers uh, in the pillars of the culture. Well, I guess as you were growing up, I, I bet there was certain times when you had to um, make certain protests or clash between with your parents or your uh, grandparents. Uh, I read your book and it was quite interesting to see how uh, you managed and mm -hmm. also the schooling is uh, different to the norm. So what were the major challenge and how do you hope to implement what you have learned to your country and also implement it to other world? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so the main challenge at the time when I dropped out of middle school when I was 15 years old uh, was that it was illegal. That was the main challenge. Uh, it's mandatory education, uh, but it's overcame thanks to the head of the school uh, who read uh, my correspondence with international researchers and said, okay, tomorrow you don't have to go to my school anymore, she said, and helped me to convince my parents and so on that it's much better if I can start uh, first my research and the entrepreneurship careers uh, earlier than the most. Uh, but later on, of course, we, we've written uh, that into the Experimental Education Acts uh, of Taiwan, and also because I also participate in the basic basic education curriculum to take some of the lessons that we've learned about autonomy, about uh, interaction based on common good principles uh, into our basic education so that if uh, I'm entering the middle school again, I now have much more room within uh, the institution so I don't have to uh, break the law. Actually, uh, the alternative experimental education is part of the institution now with up to 10% of students uh, enjoying this more research right breaking out of curriculum but feeding back uh what work and didn't uh to the basic education within the curriculum so i would say that taiwan is well on our way uh into reforming toward the kind of education of uh, autonomous learning uh that i have uh enjoyed myself since i quit middle school um and around the world i think people are also seeing because of pandemic and shared urgencies that we are now having a global neighborhood where people People are feeling closer uh, across time zones to people experiencing similar uh, experiences as compared to people living uh, in the same schools or in the same communities. So I think a lot of those communities are being formed around uh, pandemic related issues across the Internet. And that will probably continue as we take on climate action and many other planetary challenges. Right. Uh, if you are to sum up. Uh, maybe pick just three factors that would be the key to the successful digital democracy, including all the people and also the minorities. What would they be? Um, it's uh, pinned, uh, I think, on my Twitter. Uh, it's my job description. And uh, distilled to three, uh, I think it's fast, 
fair, and fun. And these three are not fungible, so all the innovations need to be at once fast, fair, and fun. Instead of saying、uh, we're chasing the speed of technology in an unfair fashion that leaves someone behind,、uh, or、uh, if we want to make a campaign that goes viral, lots of fun,、uh, but、uh, again it doesn't address inequality, then it would not work. It needs to be incremental Pareto improvements so that it's at least a little bit more fun, a little bit more fair, and a little bit faster compared to the business as usual. Well, thank you so much,、uh, Minister Tan, for your time、uh -huh. and sharing you. your insights with us. Thank you. It's a great interview.、Uh, live long and prosper.